Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. Today's episode is a uh, rebroadcast of a discussion I had with Damien, aka Sleepy Reader 666, on his YouTube channel about the Carlos Pacheco and Kurt Busick uh, series from several years ago, the six issue uh, limited series, Aerosmith, which has uh, returned recently as the, at the time of this recording with a brand new miniseries. I want to thank Damien for inviting me to do this. Uh, we had a great discussion about the the miniseries, what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it. And uh, so please follow Damien on uh, Twitter and YouTube at SleepyReader666, and I will have links in the show notes for that. Thanks for listening. I am Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien, and I have as a special guest my favorite comic book podcaster, <laughs> Eric Longbox <laughs> Review. Eric from Longbox Review. That's right. He's got a uh you've got a web page and a a, a vlog and a, and a podcast. Mhm. And uh you do post some st- sorry, I I'm not even letting you talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's Say your, hi to the folks. It's your Eric. show. Hey everybody. <laughs> hey Damon, thanks for thanks for uh in, uh inviting me to join you to talk about the the topic that I'll let you introduce since it's your show. <laughs> Yeah, we're today we're going to talk about the first six issues of Aerosmith by um, Kurt Busiak and is it Carlos? Mm-hmm. I've forgotten his first name. Carlos Pacheco uh, with Inker Marino. I've forgotten his first name. Jesus. The credits aren't on the first page here, are they? Mm. Where are they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yes, Kurt Busiak, writer, Carlos Pacheco, pencil artist, inks by Jesus Marino. Color, which I think is an important person to mm-hmm. mention, by Alex Sinclair, and lettering by Richard Starkings and his comic craft company. Yeah. And originally, this all started for us when you posted that you had gotten all six issues on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, I bought all six issues about a year ago and never read it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can force myself to read it, so to speak. <laughs> so, by, so- uh, by doing a crossover with Eric, yeah, and and then we get to hang out together. That's right, that's right. Which is the the, the you know the, talking about the comic book is just an excuse to, for us to hang out. So <laughs> exactly, and talk com any talking comics. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, Damien, since you said you you bought this uh, series about a year ago, what was it that drew you to it? What, why did you buy those issues? I think I had this first issue back when it came out. And I don't think it made a huge impression on me. Mm. But also, I was at a time when I only went to comic book stores randomly back then. And then uh, I, I was on quite a, I was on a tight budget, I think, at this point. And I was mostly reading trades from the library. So probably, if I'd stumbled across the trade at the library, I would have picked it back up. But, but I remember kind of loving the art and being intrigued by the story. Mm-hmm. And now, having read all six issues, I can see why the first issue didn't quite, um, you know, cause me to rush back to the comic book store. Yeah. Uh, but I also was in a phase where I just was, you know, now I go to the comic book store every Wednesday and I'm looking around. What else can I get? More comics, more comics. But back then I wasn't. And so then when I uh, my shop does a lot of uh, bundling, you know, they'll bundle up six a whole arc or a whole series and sell it for a pretty good price. So when I saw them all together Hmm. and thought, uh, oh, I don't have to go searching for individual issues, I I thought, oh, yeah, I've always wanted to read that. So I picked it up. Interesting. So it's fascinating because you and I have a somewhat similar story, or at least at least Uh some some details are similar because um, uh, I I did not see the first issue like in a comic shop or anything. But I was I think I was vaguely aware of it. So this you know, because this came out, uh, uh, sept- so the cover dates are September two thousand three through right. May two thousand four. So you know, we're talking, we're talking summertime of two thousand three when when the single issues were the first few single issues were coming out. Um, and and then what I remember uh, because well, I think because it was Kurt Busiek and uh, Carlos Pacheco from Avengers Forever. Uh-huh. And I think that's where I first became aware of their collaboration. And because of that, uh, you know, maybe reading, 
uh, trade magazines. Uh, what was it? Uh, Wizard back then, Wizard Magazine, uh-huh. right? Wizard probably was the big one. And and because uh, I wasn't around that time, I was actually just kind of getting back into buying a lot of different comics because uh, in the late '90s, early 2000s, I was I w- I had very few titles that I was subscribed to at my comic book shop. Because I was in, uh, I was finishing up grad school at that time, right? And didn't so have you were my... both busy and poor. Probably. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, there's a lot of things that I missed during that time period. Um, but I remember in uh, in 2004, seeing the the trade collection in a uh, at, at, in uh, the local mall where I live, a Walden uh-huh. Books. For people that remember that, ah, those that good chain. old Walden books days, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I and I saw that because uh, you know that was the only bookstore that had any any sizable uh, comic book presence, um, in at least in my area, right. and and I saw this trade on on their shelf. I'm like, oh, I really, I you know, it's Busick, it's Pacheco, Avengers Forever. This has got to be good. I flipped through it, um, you know, when I was in the store, but you know, whatever the price was back then. Uh, for that for that trade is like well I don't really have the money for that I'll I'll just kind of wait until I until I have a little extra money or whatever and I you right. know and whenever we were at the mall I'd always want to stop in and see what's at the Walden Books and I'd still see that 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 darn trade I'm like oh it's calling to me I want to read this <laughs> you know just because the pre- the the premise of this well I, and I'm sure you'll get into that in just a second but the premise of it is like this sounds really cool and yes. and then uh, there was a point where I I finally went back I decided okay. I got I've, I got a few extra bucks. I'm gonna go buy that that uh, that darn trade, and I go the next time we go to the mall. I go to that I go to Walden Books, and guess what? Uh, <laughs> not there. It's not there. <laughs> and then I just kind of forgot about the series, you know, off and on for the next fifteen or so years. Mm-hmm. And then when I signed up for the DC Universe app, the D, now now known as DC Universe Infinite, I don't, I don't know why they needed to right. add that infinite on there, but uh, some. Important corporate decision. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but they had that um, – or they had the first two issues on the app. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to read this. So I read it and I'm like, oh, my God. This is you know, this is beautiful. This is a beautiful comic book. And I kept waiting for that because I thought, okay – because that was at the time that the, the, the DC Universe app, they were slowly bringing out or, or releasing – their titles. And sometimes you'd get a few issues and then, you know, a few weeks later or a few months later, you'd get a few more issues and they never released the the other four issues. And in fact, I, this morning before we got on here, I checked to make sure, and it's still just the two, the first wow. two. What are they thinking? I know, right? It's, it, it must be <laughs> some sort of weird rights issue, even though DC owns that imprint that, you know, cause they bought right. that imprint that what, wait, what is this? Uh, Wildstorm. Wildstorm. Wildstorm, yeah. Jim Lee, it was Jim Lee's uh, imprint that he spun off from Image, and then he eventually sold to DC to get himself a nice job at DC, I guess. <laughs> and hopefully a nice it's, uh, it's worked retirement out for him. fund, too. <laughs> he's, he's, he's the only survivor in the endless mm. uh, cuts at DC. Mm-hmm. But that's that's neither here nor there. And that's interesting that it's still up there because, in fact, now... Aerosmith has finally come back and it's being published by Image Comics. Mm-hmm. And I, in my foolishness, I just went ahead and read this first issue from Image before going back and reading Aerosmith. Ah. Just because I do my weekly review show and I wanted to review it with the rest of them. And in a weird way, I think uh, reading this helped me get into the, so reading this first issue of the second arc you know, which is what, uh, almost 20 years later, 18 years later, Mm -hmm. uh, it helped me get into the, uh, make a smoother transition, ironically, into the (laughs) original story. That is so weird. You know, coming, coming into a sequel series to get you into the mood to read, (laughs) to read the, 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 the original one. (laughs) I mean, I, I remembered a few details from having Mm -hmm. read it 18, having read one issue 18 years ago. I knew the, basic premise that it was world war ii with dragons and magic yeah yeah um and then i kind of picked up on stuff so if you're if people are wondering you could start reading aerosmith with the new arc which is called behind enemy lines Mm. however i think it is richer to read to read these first 
six ones now yeah, that I yeah because you get the introduction to the characters to the world right uh and it's world war one I. I think you said world war ii earlier but did i oh i'm sorry sorry yeah i meant world war one and and so that you know like i said that that the that, that, the premise of this book uh that that whole idea of it being set during world war one so we're, we're talking i think it, the it starts in 1915 um but but with all these supernatural creatures the the magic in the world you know just that whole idea just really it sounds really really cool right well while we're talking about that setup then what you start to realize and it depending maybe on your experience as a science fiction reader you may pick up on this quicker or slower is this is it's not just magic overlaid across our history this is an alternate history mm -hmm. presumably affected by, by the fact that there's magic so there is no United States of America. Right. Um, there are, uh, and there is no Germany. It's Prussia and some other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so Germany never united. I'm presuming that the American Revolution never happened. And eventually the different colonies formed into different countries. Because there's, what is there? The United States of Columbia or something like that that right. our hero comes mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And that... And that, and they say that he lives in Connecticut, but he lives by one of the Great Lakes. So yeah. things are really different. Very different. Yeah, yeah. I was that. That was one of the nice things. I don't know if we want to get into this part just yet, but in the back of issue was it issue one, Damien, or issue one and two? two have maps. Um, one, I think, of America or what oh, we call America. You're, I think no. Issue one is Europe. Oh, is and, issue one Europe? Yeah, and then issue two oh, you're is right. is and issue two is United. Yeah, the United States of Columbia, and yeah, you see. It is so bizarre to see. So they're... I'll put my overhead camera. On, okay. But yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, Connecticut is like this really thin state across uh, the area. Massachusetts has like three different areas broken up by the by the one of the Great Lakes. It's just, it's just fascinating how this stuff right. uh, was was conceived of and 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 shown. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's thinking when Connecticut. I mean, I always think of Connecticut as being named after the Connecticut River, but I'm not sure if the Connecticut River is in this Connecticut. <laughs> See, I didn't even know there was a Connecticut River, so. Yeah. So that was an Indian name, and it was the Connecticut ah, River. Ah, okay. And they named the state of Connecticut, because I, I grew up in Connecticut. Ah, all right. I'm not right. expecting everyone in all 50 states to know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so since we're talking about this stuff uh, in particular, uh, there was a name that uh, we left off earlier as one of the... I'll just say creators, more of a consultant, but that's Lawrence Watt Evans. Oh, very good point. I forgot about it. Who him. is credited as the alternate consultant. Right. And uh, you may know about uh, Mr. Watt Evans more than I, um, given your science fiction mm. background. I have not read any of his novels. I've read some of his short stories. And um, he was a popular for a while. I don't think he's that popular now. Um, science fiction writer. And um, I don't recall if he would, there was a huge boom in the nineties. I think, I think it was the nineties of all these alternate history um, books. And maybe he was one of the people who wrote them. Yes. Um, yeah. And in fact, uh, oh, did you look him up? Or? One, of, one of the, one of the novels. Uh, uh, so I have this, I found an interview with Kurt Busick uh, on uh, CBR from many years ago. I don't remember when exactly, oh, cool. but anyway, uh, he mentions Watt Evans, uh, consulting with Watt Evans to come up with the backstory, you know, the divergence, uh, the, the divide, divergent events of, of our history, our, our real history mm -hmm. to come up with this alternative world that Aerosmith is set in. And, right. um, so let's see here. He says, this is from Busick. I've been uh, I've been talking with my friend Lawrence Watt Evans, the fantasy novelist, when he was casting around for the subject of a big sprawling fantasy epic. I suggested that he do something with biplane pilots as wizards. He went somewhere else with a suggestion, taking the idea of new magical technologies and turning it into his novel Touched by the Gods. So I took the rest of the idea back, combining it with the other bit about a shared universe of fantasy and fairy tales, and Carlos Pacheco and I shaped it and built it into Aerosmith. Ah, so in a sense, they collaborated on some, you know, brainstorming, mm -hmm. and each went off and did a different thing. So here's the map of Europe. We've got Prussia, Troilia slash Hungary. France is Gallia, K 
Castile, Lusitania. I guess uh, Spain is Spain is not united either. Castile and Aragon. A- Aragon. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. So if you study European history, there was a series of unifications, right? Mm. Um, Germany was one of the last countries in our world to unify into one country. And that, that may be part of the political trouble with Germany that these two wars <laughs> centered around them. I used to know, I used to know a lot more about this. Mm. <laughs> I took a course on what they called modern European history, which was mostly the 1800s um, when I was in college. It it ended their their version of modern European history when I was in college ended at World War One, mm. <laughs> but so there's a whole series of the politics of various countries that are trying to form into larger countries um, that played a big role in uh, World War One. Well, you know far more about it than I do. <laughs> so. Yeah, but but I just have vague memories now. Um, apparently I, I slept through my uh my uh, european history class if uh-huh. if i even had one i don't even remember <laughs> right well i was i was almost i almost had a minor in history i took so many history courses mm. so it's sad that i can't remember the finer details anymore just the general impressions so one assumes from the little bit of evidence and the little bit of what's left in my memory that he probably had researched a lot of the early modern European history to put this together. Well, really early because uh, uh, music goes on and uh, explains a little bit more of oh, that. So you have my source. So that, right? uh, he says, Watt Evans helped us create the history of it, working out what changed and why in the years since the peace of Charlemagne in 800 wow. AD. Wow. So he really went back. Yeah. Uh, which country survived, which died, which royal lines married into which, what happened to the mercantile empires and on and on. It all fits together and makes logical sense. Uh, though I credit Lawrence uh, with it way more than me. So we hope to tell stories set in the history of the world as well as following the development of the war. With any luck, it'll be as much fun for the readers as it is for us. Fun is an interesting word when you're mm. talking about war. Exactly, right? <laughs> Especially the arc of this particular six-issue series. Right. And the char- right. and so, Fletcher Aerosmith, the, the main character. Yeah, so as we were saying before we started recording, this series has a very clear arc, issue to issue, and the six issues of a, well, I would call it the, the innocent idealist uh, goes step by step deeper into the horrors of war and mm-hmm. the the moral murkiness of it all, or the ultimately lack of morals of it all. Perhaps mm-hmm. at first he seems like a character right out of some kind of boys novel, you know, <laughs> writ, written yes. in the early twentieth century. Oh, that's perfect. You know, just the plucky gung ho kid who's going to do good and and will succeed because he has a good heart and open person yes and uh you know there's bullies along the way and and uh, older people who give him advice and all of that stuff let's see if i can yeah i'm not as good at this as damien is um but you see fletcher there in this one panel uh he's the red-haired boy and just the the look on his face you know he's he's so happy to see these uh these arrow men oh there we go right. thank you Right. And there they are all very ideal yes. looking like shining knights, so to speak, flying through the air. Yeah. And there he is in the crowd, the fresh face boy. Not quite blonde. Well, I guess he's blonde, blondish, reddish, mm-hmm. strawberry blonde, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so pretty much your uh, cliched leading hero. And um, and he's a plucky kid who has a grumpy father and an older brother. And yeah, so... So very much, and the the whole tone of it is 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 as if they're doing that kind of story, mm-hmm. right? Um, even the kind of peripheral stuff, like they call it a challenger picture magazine. It's like this is, it's almost like we're picking up an early pulp magazine for young boys yes. to have rousing adventures. I was hoping you'd bring that up because that's one of the things I liked. About. So that whole idea of of uh, yeah, what are they? What do they call it? A cliffhanger picture magazine, a, a monthly right. magazine for the adventurer and hero. So the whole, I mean, it, they're getting a little meta with it, you know, because uh, they're right. they're publishing this comic book, but they're they're treating it like this 
like this other thing. And and yeah, and and uh, every issue except for the first one starts off with this this uh, recap page. Right. But but it's it des- looks very glamorous. And- yeah, it's it's designed to look like something else. And then and uh, like you saw there in that lower left corner or in the right corner, in the case of that issue you're showing, there's always a few items that uh, Pacheco threw in there mm-hmm. that that pertain specifically to the to the the story of that issue. And it's just those kinds of details. I, I just I just love because it it creates a much more immersive experience for the story itself or the comic book itself. It's just wonderfully put together this this right. comic book series. Yeah. And he he uh he gains kind of a plucky girlfriend, the rich girl who decides to give it all up to yep. go help help out the soldiers on the front by mm-hmm. uh working with the ambulances. And what would you call it? I mean, this is also kind of a familiar character trope, the kind of the Ben Grimm of the story, the grumpy, not quite human, but can relate to our plucky hero kind of character. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's you talking about the troll, the rock troll. Is he a t- rock troll. He's from. Um, I forget. I, I don't know what equivalent country he's from, but he's a big yeah. rocky kind of creature. Well, and that's he's, that's his name or nickname too in the story is Rocky. Oh right, and he's a rock troll from Lot Lotharingia. Okay, which I don't know what country that's supposed to be. And he's a follower of old gods, mm, the North gods, in fact, because that right. that does come into it uh, a few times right, a later in the series. Northern gods. So maybe he's a rock troll of Northern Europe. I I don't know why I got Eastern Europe in my head. So, and then there's um, I forget the uh, there's the dashing. I guess that might be in the third issue. The dashing leader of his squadron with the thin mustache and... Captain Fox, I think you're referring to? Captain Fox, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess maybe that's not even until later. Yeah, so he's kind of the the role model and the the older adult who... who, uh, who also says good things about him all the time and Mm -hmm. how great he is and Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, I think he comes in in issue four trying to get... uh, Because... Uh, we're kind of jumping around here, but uh, uh, Fletcher experiences war and 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 what that means and the horrors of it, and he's having a hard time with it, and right. and he's he's basically isolating himself and not hanging out with his his comrades and 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 uh, so uh, Fox talks to him about that and tries to get him out of his own head and convinces him, right. you know, just go into town. You 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 need to you need to experience life and not just dwell on the death and and destruction right, right. and and uh, dis, you know the 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 the, the bad aspects. Well, are there right. any, are there any good aspects of war? I was gonna say. so <laughs> um and, and but it helps him. And then uh, you know uh, later at issue five, he uh, Fox actually rescues Fletcher from from being killed, and then you know in six gives him some sagely you know mentorly uh, older brother type advice you know to help him through the the events of what happens in issue six and then well to totally spoil it um but i think this is i should have said it i'll put in the description spoilers <laughs> right right um that uh and then finally sacrifices himself mm-hmm. uh for the larger group and up till the very end he's just cool and suave about it yes yes I, in fact, in my notes here, I have Captain Fox is really the hero of the story overall for for yes. those for, for those various reasons, and then of course culminating in his own self sacrifice to save uh, that the uh, what's left of that squadron and right. and everybody else that's around. So yeah, that was that was probably the more the most affecting aspect of this to me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, aside from the descent that Fletcher goes through from being right. that ideal, idealistic young man who wants to go and make a difference um, right. in Europe uh, to to fight the Prussians and the uh, I forget the other country that uh, right that, that we're talking about unfamiliar <laughs> but but and then and then w- that's one of the things I like about Trollians, yes I guess. <laughs> the the as we go through each issue from being introduced to the world in issue one issue two they go to New York to join up. Um, issue three, I forget now. Oh, they're they're traveling to Europe. They're traveling over across the ocean, 
Right. And the ship gets attacked by a Nazi sea serpent. What they, they call them, unterseamen. No, they're not called Nazis either. So R- I don't right. Know what, yeah. They're obviously, wait, we're, we're in World War One. It would never have been called Nazis. Anyway. Right, right. Uh, and then uh, issue four is uh, it's called No Man's Land. Um, so he, you know, get fur- further descending into uh, into the war and its its effects on him. Right. Uh, and then there's right. the fir- the first death. Sorry to interrupt. No, but the go- first death in issue three is viewed as this noble death that yes. served a purpose and saved everybody. Yeah, right. And then by issue four, his comrades are just being cut down, and it's kind of seems like pointless deaths. Mm-hmm. And and then we realize, you know, war is just about a lot of random people dying, right? Often in ugly ways. That's yeah. Um, like I said, what 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 is the good of war? <laughs> right. There's no justice to it. It's not like yeah. Two two noble knights come out and fight, and the one with the purer heart wins the battle and mm-hmm. saves mm-hmm. the day. You know, that's probably one one criticism I have of this um, is that we we never get into the head or see things from the viewpoint of you know the other side, the, you know, the quote unquote bad guys. In fact, they refer to them quite often, uh, through various characters as monsters. Right. But I also understand that that's not the story that's being told here. It's just, it's just, you know, this is, we're really seeing the whole thing from Fletcher's point of view. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so I understand that, but, uh, it, it does come across a little too one-sided perhaps. Right. Well, but there's begins to be hints. Mm. Uh, so the the next issue, I believe, uh, five is where, in a sense, they uh, they're sent out on again what seems like kind of a noble mission with a new experimental magic thing to throw at the at the uh, Prussian lab, mm-hmm. and instead it burns down the entire city and just destroys all the civilians and everyone. Right. Um, which is essentially like fire bombings that that we allies did on Germany in mm-hmm. World War Two, mm-hmm. which is sort of where I start mixing World War Two and World War One together a bit in my mind with this. Yeah, I I um, think Busick was doing that on purpose to you know uh, calling up things that were probably more recent in, right. in memory and also calling back to things that actually happened uh, in during World War Two. So that right. we would have a, a maybe more of a, a, a way to ground ourselves into in in the the ideas or the story that he's yeah. trying to tell. Well, and and also perhaps you know once you create these airmen and you have magic, you have something a little a little more advanced than the uh, biplanes. Right. Of World War. That's I. true. That's true. So and then in in the fifth issue, he starts to realize that the uh, anger of the Prussians in the next conflict is because of what he did. Right. And they may have a good point, he realizes. So That's there true. is a hint yeah. that they may not be what he thinks or what he's been taught they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I suppose that's that's a, a compliment to Fletcher himself because he is he is uh self-aware. Um right. he's not that he's not just that that former idealized young boy. Um he he does see things from different perspectives. Uh, which you know uh, they could have gone the other way with the story, obviously. But right. but uh, at least we, you're right. You're absolutely right. They, they, we do get a little bit, a tiny a sliver. <laughs> In the first issue, we're so, showed this guy, the Blood Emperor. I think he's called. Mm-hmm. Rocky tells us about him, and he's a dark sorcerer who makes of Troilia and Prussia and Bavaria his puppets, and he just wants blood and pain and death and misery that he feasts on like a vampire. I don't know now by the end of the series, if that's true or not. <laughs> right. That was one of the glaring uh, oversights I felt in the story uh, was, you know, propping up this, uh, uh, the blood emperor as, as a real person that, right. that, that somehow is controlling everything uh, from, from the, the Prussian and Tyrolean uh, perspective. Yeah, we right. never get back to that, and then and then how does that tie into the North gods that we see in the later chapters? Because uh, we, right. It, right. it is suggested heavily that they are real, uh, even though the way it's presented uh, in in what was it issue five that um, it could it could just be yeah there we go that you're you're seeing the the, the panels there it could there. just be his delusion exactly in the middle of you know intense conflict. Mm-hmm. But 
it seems like it's real because we're in a world of magic. He has a special stone that's related to the North gods that his friend Rocky gave him. Right. And Rocky is fighting because of the North gods. That's his reason for fighting, at least in this series. Well, also, uh, in, I think in the first issue, you know, Rocky was telling, uh, like you said, Rocky was telling, uh, Fletcher about, uh, the, the blood, blood emperor God. and, and why he came to, um, the Columbia from Europe to escape, mm-hmm. to escape the, the atrocities there. Right. Um, and then Fletcher calls him out on it. How could, how could you not stay and fight for freedom, you know, for whatever. And, and that, uh, caused a, a bit of a rift between them until later. Right. Until later when Rocky just kind of shows up, Mm -hmm. Rocky just shows up in Europe having enlisted because he was inspired by Fletcher. Exactly. I thought that was a bit cheesy. (laughs) You know, a guy who's gone through the horrors of war and escaped to another country. And then just because some young 15 year old or whatever tells him, oh, you should have, you should Mm -hmm. fight for truth and justice. Well, Um, okay. So yeah, so I I agree with you because I, you know, if I'm going to. And that's the weird thing about this whole book, right? It's both playing with the tropes of this cheesy boys adventure, but it still kind of wants, it wants it both ways. Exactly. I was just going to say it it, Um, there, my issues with it it is that it. makes it a bit of an odd read as you read it as an adult anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't, it doesn't really go beyond a lot of those tropes. And so while it is, while it is a, um, a well-written, a well-constructed world, obviously we, we've talked about that quite a bit, uh, the, the, the characterization, the characters, uh, the, 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 the whole story, the arc of the story, it all is well-constructed, but it doesn't go be much beyond just that basic story of an idealized young man going off to war and realizing the horrors of it. And, right. and while he is severely impacted by it in many, many different ways, it doesn't really do anything else with it. Yeah. The, the, and, and the saving grace, if, if you'll pardon, cause the, the, the young lady that he, uh, uh, ends up developing a relationship with his name, grace, uh, uh the saving okay. grace of this series to me is the Pacheco Marino art, uh, a Sinclair art. I, I always want to include right. the colorist too, because there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's very distinctive color, very yeah. distinctive color. Mm-hmm. And the color choices, I think, have a lot to do with some kind of idealized, this is actually from the, the new arc, um, sorry, but for some sort of idealized uh, past, pulpy, slightly pulpy past. Mm-hmm. Damien, is is the new series is is it the same uh, artist Pacheco, Marino, and Sinclair? I think it's a different inker, mm. but other than that, the same team. Oh no, I am wrong. It's not the same colorist. Okay, so the Jose Villa, Villa Robia is the new colorist. Okay, and he's following. Well, that's too bad that Alex Sinclair is not included, but he's following Alex Sinclair's lead. Mm, good. Um, but uh, but uh, I feel kind of sad that Alex Sinclair isn't part of it. Yeah, I think the the art team is absolutely fabulous in yeah. a very particular kind of style. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's it 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 evokes classic illustration, but is also an excellent comic book storytelling, and and the and the coloring just gives it kind of a. A patina of the past, but also kind of a a beauty. To yes, it. yes. So it does feel like you're looking at something from the past. Since since you're talking about that in particular, so there there are uh, there were a few issues that had letters pages when they were still doing those, and uh, right. so uh, there's a few things in here that I pulled out okay. uh, of the various ones. You were just talking about the coloring. I wanted to ask you about this uh, specifically because in issue four, there's a letter where one writer complains that the colors are too rich and need to be uh, more down to earth. And I was curious what your response would be to that. I I sympathize with that because I often want coloring to be simpler. And this is probably in a period where they were just getting better at their computer coloring. Mm-hmm. You know, it was really horrible in the nineties and, some of the colorists, like Alex Sinclair, were kind of getting on top of it. 
But I bet that this looked better on your the two issues you read digitally. I bet the color looked even better there. Oh yeah, yeah. See, and that's one of the the tragedies so, of them not including those other issues is that you know I could I could look at them that way. Yeah. But but despite that, I mean, the, the coloring it, it in here is really good. It weighs heavily on the page, mm -hmm. you know. And I think I am I am getting used to modern coloring by now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think this would have been harder on my eyes back then mm. than it is now. Mm -hmm. It was a, it's a weird transition to the color is part of the visual language of the comics. Right. And the, the visual language of the comics has changed mm. from say, you know, nine, 19, late 1980s to early two thousands. It's a big, big visual change. Well, you know, part of that is also the paper stock that, that, uh, that they transition to the more slicker True. paper, which is, this right. is not, this is kind of like an intermediate intermediate uh, yeah, type exactly. of paper from, from, right. you know, the stuff from that we, we first started reading, uh, yeah. growing up to, to what we have now. So yeah, I could, I don't know. I, I guess I, I, I disagreed with the letter writer. I thought they were pretty mm -hmm. down to earth. Yeah, I'm. I mostly disagree with the letter writer, writer except I sympathize with, with uh, yeah. him or her. Well, it's, because I've gone through issues with color. It's it's such a it's such a um, interesting concept because you, the coloring has to enhance uh, and or support or both the story that is being told. And you know, starting off with issue one, like it would keep, I keep using this word, but you know, the idealized outlook of Fletcher and his world. It's it's so. Um, isolated and, uh, you know, the, the war is not in Colombia. It's over across the ocean. And so they don't, they, you know, it's, it's a very different coloring at the beginning of the series, you know, it's lighter, brighter. Um, and, and then as you, as it transitions over to Europe, things get darker and we have more night scenes, you know, and, and, uh, uh, some of the, the, the contrasts of some of the scenes that, and I'll talk about some of these later when we get into like, if we're going to get into like particular issue things, cause there's certain, uh, art, artistic and, and storytelling aspects that I want to, I want to point out of this, but the, the overlapping of one scene to another and how the coloring enhances that descent into darkness, I'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so for, I have another criticism of it. I, I think I, it sounds like maybe I enjoyed this more than you did. Um, <laughs> I felt like I, I thought it was very interesting how he was overlaying the horrors of war with this boy's adventure story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I felt in a way, in a lot of ways, it was uh, a clever way to, in theory, seduce people into reading this story and then <laughs> making them realize how terrible war is. Yeah. Do, do you think though, that that really is what uh, Busick and, and Pacheco are after is to uh, like some sort of uh, veiled diatribe uh, that's anti-war or something either else. that or or because they've studied history so much at least an awareness of how in what an incredible meat grinder mm. world war one was yeah yeah and of course world war ii was a meat grinder in another way yeah but um but i think they're not completely in control of that because i think he's too in love with the boy's story yes the so he wants it both ways and it's it just, at least to an adult, I think it reads a little, a little flip floppy, or you know, not quite sticking to your guns yeah. of the horror of war. And definitely, I mean, I'm going to keep reading it, but uh, we return to kind of, uh, at least in the issue one of the new series of Behind Enemy Lines, of a slightly more idealistic world. Although he is a bit war weary, hmm. and he, a part of the issue takes place in England when he's kind of on a bit of a break from the front lines and there's uh the the problem between different classes in England and that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. So uh, shifting the focus of some of the socio-historical aspects uh examining those right. a little bit, a little a little right. more. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know how deep he's going to go into that before we go into his right. behind enemy lines. Mm -hmm. He's obviously going to be kind of a spy or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I like this a lot, but I, I sort of see that that there's something a little off in his different, what seems to be his different intentions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my, my, But my bigger complaint, like, complaint, like I think I would enjoy this a lot more if he dug a little deeper into the alternate history. Yeah. He leaves it so much in the background. <laughs> 
that like I if I hadn't experienced reading a number of alternate history novels before and um and also um sort of picked up from reading the second the beginning of the second arc <laughs> picked up oh we're in alternate history everything's different there's no united states um i think i would have struggled with like what is going on here mm. in terms of that and now i'm really interested in the details of his alternate history but he's not giving us very much other than those maps and yeah. a few changed names so he's got it all worked out in his head but but he's saving it for and it took him 20 years to get back to the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So since we're on the topic, um, uh, there's a couple things that, uh, you know, because like I mentioned the letters, the letter, letters pages, right. Busick himself would, would respond to the letter writers um, and also provide some some other information along the way. But he, uh, in issue three's letter column, he talks about having over 20 pages of alternate history notes and even more on geography. Uh, geography. Um, he also mentions wanting to do prequel specials that will inform the history of the world uh-huh and and also doing uh he he mentions later and one of the other the later issues about doing other mini series set in this world right so he had ver- a very grand mm-hmm. idea mm-hmm. And there was also, um, did you get this also, Damien? An Astro City crossover yes. with Aerosmith. It it wasn't a crossover, but it was a uh, a special uh, to promote Astro City at that time and Aerosmith because uh, it was oh, right. coming out at the a same flip time. Book, yeah, that would have Aerosmith on one side and Astro City, and Astro City is why I was interested in this because uh, mm-hmm. I was a huge Astro City that, fan. I'm sure that was another reason I I got into it too. I, I mentioned Avengers Forever, but yeah, Busick's Astro City was a huge reason why I I wanted to read anything that Busick was writing. So did did you happen to get that uh, Astro City Aerosmith um, uh, special? I don't think so. Okay, unless it's somewhere buried in my boxes and I forgot that I had it. I I actually ordered it. After you Just and recently? I, oh uh, yeah, it, and it's it's uh-huh. on its way. It hasn't arrived uh-huh. yet, so okay. it it will it will arrive next week, I suspect. And so too late for us, our talk, but but yeah. uh, I'm really curious because it was it was he says Busick says that um, the plan was to include more maps in that. So I'd be I'd right. be uh, very I'm very curious, yeah, uh, what uh, what we actually get out of that. I think in my uh, my opinion, he should have included maps in every issue. I agree. He showed us a big map of Europe, but maybe we should have a zoomed in map of wherever mm-hmm. the action's taking place yeah. at that time. That would help us piece things together a bit. And um, I don't know, a little bit more of the geopolitics of this imaginary world would mm-hmm. really be helpful. Mm-hmm. And uh, more hints at how magic changed things. Yes, that especially. You know, yeah, that because. That's- Obviously, he's figured out. Wait, now I now I know from you. Way back to the Charlemagne's time, how magic would have shifted history around, mm-hmm. um, which is a great concept. I mean, I really like that. But but he's he hasn't put it on the page yet. Uh, you know, and to be fair, um, you know, he they are trying to at that time, two thousand three, uh, promote right. a comic book about a war that was you know a, a very long time ago. Yes. <laughs> even at that point. Uh, and uh, introducing this entirely new world and characters, and so there's only so much we you know they can fit into the you know twenty whatever how many pages they are True. for True. for six issues. And obviously, you know while they got to tell their their first story, you know uh, did it did it not sell well enough to really uh, keep the 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 creative team going with with other issues uh other stories down the way maybe that was it i can't remember now the ex i saw when they first announced that aerosmith was coming back some explanations Mm. oh okay i missed that so and i think with a image deal they can um you don't have to sell as much for Mm. the creators to make as much money that's true yeah um, because the creators get a bigger share of each each sale how and and so there may have been an issue of getting the rights back from Wildstorm. It may have taken a while to do that. Could be, yeah. That's Especially true. with DC in the mix, <laughs> um, you know, the corporate lawyers and such. There, there is uh, 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 Busick talks a lot in these letter columns. You know, another factor involved with this was was he wanted to work with Pacheco on the sequel or sequels, right? And Pacheco at that time was was becoming a hot commodity, and mm-hmm. he was being pulled off in these different directions. 
uh, one of those things he mentions a couple of times in the letters, you know, Pacheco was off doing an arc on uh, Superman, Batman at the time that I, I, I got those issues. And I, and again, uh-huh. I was like, oh, this guy is so good. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you're doing a project that's just one artist and that artist has other things to do, mm-hmm. you're but so, all, uh, to be mean about Mr. Busick, because I love his writing. Um, I love Astro City. And I loved, um, oh, shoot, what was it called? It was first called Tooth and Claw, and then they had to change the name of it. Autumn Lands? Autumn Lands. So I was super into Autumn Lands. I bought, I bought all the issues, and then I bought the trades. And then they just stopped. Yeah. And uh, he says that's coming back. Yep. So I think he has he makes plans that are too big <laughs> and then he doesn't have the time and energy and his co-creators don't have the time and energy to mm. complete them. Mm-hmm. That could be. Um that's I think that's why Astro City remains his best thing because it's made up of lots of little short stories and if there's a gap you're not feeling like you're missing something. That's like Autumn true. Land is going to be really hard for anybody to pick up on now. Mm. Um and uh but the man has I think he has more than most modern comic book writers and he's, he's basically my age. So a little older than you, but um, like me and probably like you has read a lot of fiction and is seeped in, not in Hollywood and video games and other comics, but has re- along with, he is seeped in comics obviously, but has, has read um, ton, you know, tons of alternate history and Jack Vance and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I, I get, I picked that up cause I went to a column where he was talking about autumn lands and all the different influences that went into it. And that made me realize he's read a lot of the stuff that I've read over the years. Mm. So, and that's kind of, that kind of makes me relate to him more. Like part of what I relate to in um, my favorite comics is all the influences of other kind of pulp fiction and fiction kind of influences. Right that are less of an influence now Mm -hmm. for the younger writers. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very true. And yeah, and you're not always, it's not always obvious that uh, Mm -hmm. these are influences, but if, if you have that background, if you have that experience reading those things, you can, you can, you can uh, pick up on those things a lot easier. And, and in, in Aerosmith, I feel like he paces the story more like novels I read as a kid than like a typical comic book. There aren't as many of those, you know, sudden reveals and um, uh, other kind of little tricks that uh, comic book pacing has. It's more novelistic in its pacing. Yeah, it I, does. I could see that. It skips time between each issue. Mm-hmm. So um, maybe a novel, there would be a few more chapters because you have more more space. Mm-hmm. But. Mm-hmm. but but at the uh, for example, there uh, boy, which issue was that? The issue where there. Going to Europe. Issue three? Three. Where they're on the boat? Yes, that's the one. So uh, that ends... No, that's not what I'm talking about. (laughs) I have forgotten uh, which... Does one of them end in a more typical comic book cliffhanger? No, no, not a typical cliffhanger. just, Just the... There is a scene in one of the issues... So uh, uh, let me see if I can find it in my notes because uh, I'm not finding it in the – going through the issues here. Yes. I'm sorry. It's issue one. <laughs> Always go back to your notes is the moral of the story. So there's – oh, yeah. Here's one. Uh, the very last page of issue one, um, he he and his friend Jonathan are – they've they've uh, skipped town. They've run away to go join mm-hmm. uh, the Aero Corps. And we get this wonderful two pa- uh, the, those final two panels. We see the moon, right? And you know they're he, they're on the train uh, heading to New York. And he's like, uh, "We're doing this because it needs to be done. We're we're going to accomplish something, going to make a difference in the world. Right? We're going to matter." And then we see that final panel there that you're showing in the video of those those sprites hovering above all of the dead bodies with that same moon. It's just those kinds right. of, and there, there's another one like that where they're on the ship that I was trying to, that I was originally thinking of. Basically, he's saying something very similar about 
about mattering and making a difference. And what we see is the dark, murky sea that they've just thrown, not thrown, they've buried the body of their fallen comrade. You know, very Mm -hmm. similar ideas, but done differently. But you get these wonderful endings to the issues like this or endings to scenes where it's not like the typical uh, uh, big reveal or page turn or whatever, but it is a nice way to what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, transition to juxtapose. Well, definitely that, but, but, but kind of, um, move from one issue to the other, because we're not only moving through time and space, uh, in the story, you know, it's just the ideas of this, the transformation that Fletcher goes through. It's, it's that, what would that scene that we're seeing right there in issue one is, is basically the arc that we see him going through up to issue five. And you could not do this in a novel. Exactly. Perhaps that's your point. This is very so. This yes, he does utilize techniques that only comics can do. Yeah, yeah. I very think I was well just done. Talking about the the pacing, the the sort of more deliberate than normal comic book pacing. It doesn't feel as much in a rush. That's true. And and it doesn't feel like it it relies on these page turn shocks. There's this kind of juxtaposition shock. Mm-hmm. There's the horror of war shock. Um, it's not at all – and Busek is a master of the comic book format, I mm-hmm. think. So I didn't mean to imply that that he wasn't using comic book um, D- Damien, do you think techniques. that uh, part of our – what we're butting up against here, our mm, – objection is too strong of a word, but uh, our reaction to this overall story and not, not, it not having as much, I don't know, impact on us is that we're so used to reading – modern comics that that deliver stories in a certain way that is a little more um uh, perhaps action oriented or or you know the the bling they they bring the bling right. to to the <laughs> stories that we're not really getting here it's a, it's just it's just a different way of telling a a comic book tale that we don't really, right. really see that often i don't think and that's maybe why i'm i give it uh I give it some extra space mm. in my head. Mm-hmm. It's it's trying to do something different. I think he's going to I think conceptually it's always got to stay both the the old old school boys adventure novel and the horrors of war. Yeah. which is perhaps a limit a limitation which but it, it's an interesting conceit or concept. It seems in a way in a vein of the kind of things Alan Moore was doing around this mm. same time, you know, with Tom Strong and um, and uh, uh, Top Ten and those kinds of things where he had a kind of concept of a type of story and then he used it as a framework to play with the medium. Yes. I, I don't think uh, Alan Moore in those particular comics wanted to get into as heavy stuff as as this does Mm -hmm. but um yeah so even though to me it's it's a limitation i'm still excited to read more yeah oh yeah i think it's just interesting that he had this whole concept of a of a different way to to tackle both these kinds of stories Mm -hmm. he's an old-fashioned kind of guy in certain ways and then an innovative comic book writer in other ways (laughs) i think that's i think that's kind of cool but I don't think I have a feeling I'll never love this as much as I do Astro City. Oh yeah, yeah, I can, I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> but the Pacheco art helps a lot. It, yeah, yes. Um, uh, one of the things about that uh, did I did I already talk about this, Damien? Uh, the way that he draws faces in particular, mm-hmm. how his eyes, his eyes. A lot of comic book artists cannot do eyes very well. <laughs> Um, but, uh, the, 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 the faces are so expressive. I, I, earlier on, I showed in the video, uh, that, that, and Damien's showing it right now that, you know, the, 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 uh, Fletcher and his friends there and, and how excited Fletcher is in that panel. And there's some other ones where, uh, even on that very first page of that first issue, Damien, the sh- showing the soldiers reacting to the pixies or whatever they're called. Right. The very beginning of the book shows us some horror of war and shows us that, it's a magical war, I guess. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. From from page one, we are we are introduced to the whole idea that this is not your your typical World War One story. 
Um, but, right. but yeah, it just, the, yeah, that the, I don't know if people can see that in the video, but the, the, the look of that soldier there in that middle panel, you know, just the, the beautifully drawn face and, and how expressive his eyes and how he's like, well, look at this. This is, this is incredible. Right. And then you turn the page. It's like, oh no, it's not so incredible. <laughs> A moment of joy before he gets killed. Uh, yeah. Such, such wonderful work. Yeah. Oh, oh. And, um, uh, there is in issue one, there is that two page spread showing Fletcher's town where we get to see, you know, what wonderfully constructed by Pacheco, uh, seeing this, this 1915 town and the, the feel of it, the construction of the buildings. Oh, yes. Yeah, and then, beautiful. then there, uh, in issue, issue five, is it the atrocity issue? We get the exact same two-page layout of Holbrook, the, the town that is that is firebombed by our heroes, and it's it's exactly the same. Um, obviously, the buildings are different; this, the locale is different. But the is the, that in five? I'm only seeing individual. Is it after it's destroyed? So maybe it's in issue six. Oh no, there it is. There it is. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So we're getting the. Yep. There we go. Well, for lack of a better word, the American city, American town, mm-hmm. and then the European town. Yeah, I, I just I love how yeah you you've got them overlap there. That's wonderful. The the showing the two sides of war, the the two sides of the story, uh, but done exact almost exactly the same way from you know from the layout perspective. So right, just those little bits are just wonderful. Emphasizing the people, people have lives everywhere that mm-hmm. aren't that dissimilar. But then it all gets destroyed. And let me see, is it issue six? That's what's left. <laughs> yes. That's what war does to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that destruction is just horrific. It's weird, but while I was reading this, I couldn't help but thinking about people we see on the news who talk about maybe they should pull out their guns because they're not happy with the way an election went. Mm. And uh, do they want this as a result of their unhappiness about an election? Bad choice in my mind. Mm. Um, but I won't get any more political. Than that, but, um, <laughs> you know, you're making me appreciate even more what Pacheco's doing here. Cause I didn't, I didn't catch that parallel. And uh, when you pointed out, with the the moon where he was sleeping on the train and then the moon over uh, a battlefield, he does a lot of nice parallels. Here. Mm-hmm. I was thinking when you were talking about uh, facial, ex- oops, wrong issue now, facial expressions that he does a fantastic job of showing Fletcher grow up. That's oh yeah. Yeah. So here mm-hmm. he is, you know, just the idealistic kid. And then even by issue two, when he's been going through some just preliminary training, he's the same person. But it's just the whole way that uh, Pacheco does his expressions and his ma- way of holding himself has mm-hmm. changed. Mm-hmm. And then it, it changed. I don't know if I have as good an example later on, but um, it, it continues to change throughout the comic sort of. All done with just a few lines. You know, that's that's the great art of it. It's not like he does super detailed faces. Yeah, that's Whoops. that this, is this that is, is the most incredible aspect of that is that it's there's not much to it in terms of the construction of the art. And yet right. it is so evocative. I, I yeah. you know, part of that is of course, um uh I think the coloring plays a, a coloring a plays a role part. too. But there's so, like just the way he's tilting his head here when he was in the younger phase, he would never have been – the weight of the world is holding him down. Yeah, yes. Pacheco has really, really thought of, yes. of these characters and what the physicality of that psychological stuff would be. Yeah, it, it, it is rare for me to think in terms of a, a comic book, in terms of the art being the larger – part of of this of this of the comic book itself mm-hmm. and usually i focus on the words and what the characters are saying and the overall kind of story uh that happens um all of that of course is is all tied together because you know art is part of that but it's right. in this particular series though it may it really jumped out at me how much uh this series works because of pacheco and marino and sinclair right 
we you know it it makes me realize he's a, he's not just a great illustrator or a great artist he's a great comic book storyteller yes and the the art is telling so much and i think that's what I, when i don't when i read certain comics and i they just don't have any effect on me i think it's often because the artist is not carrying all that extra weight that mm. someone like Pacheco is carrying. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. But, um, I mean, the, the writer could be also at fault, of yeah. course, but, <laughs> but, uh, I think, I think, uh, the, I, I personally think in most cases, the writer, the artist is carrying more of the, the real weight. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it may or may not, have been inspired by the writer. The writer may be sort of the root and then the, and then the artist is the whole tree. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm a great worshiper of great comic book artists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I really appreciate you helping me appreciate Pacheco better. Well, okay. So, uh, again, going back to the letters, since we're, since you just said that, uh, one of the writers uh, in issue three in the letter page, yeah, mm -hmm. compared the emotional impact of the art to Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby. What do you think wow. about that? It's a hard to make a one to one comparison because mm. those guys are are the ultimate shapers of uh, of superhero art, and this is not at all superhero art, right? Yeah. I when looking at this, I'm thinking more about uh, the tradition of Alex Raymond and Hal Foster, ah. and and then taken into a modern context and a, a more sophisticated psychology. Although I think if you look at Hal Foster, you'll see a lot of the characterization done in similarly by the positioning of the characters and the like. Mm. But Hal Foster never leaves that realm of boys' adventure. Um, or not very much <laughs> in, in to the extent that I, I have a few uh, Prince Valiant books. I, I used to love reading Prince Valiant in the Sunday papers when, mm -hmm. I, when I was a kid. And, and Hal Foster and, and uh, Alex Raymond were huge influences on generations of comic book artists. But, uh, but I feel like Ditko and, and Kirby would be the ones who broke past that in mm -hmm. a sense mm -hmm. and created a new vocabulary for the at the time more modern superhero comics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think the the uh, the letter writer is maybe making too much of, right <laughs> of the art. Not not to take away obviously because we love yeah. Pacheco's art here, but right. Well, he he's a uh, he's a great artist, and I, I actually have not been very aware of him. I mean, I vaguely got splashes of Pacheco here and there, but I did not read his Avengers, and I don't know if I. I read. I don't think I read that Batman Superman. Mm. I remember reading some Busiek Superman in my random forays into comic book stores, mm -hmm. and those I would pick up. And maybe because I, I still thought I could just pick up random comics and pick up on the story, I didn't get much out of them. And so I thought <laughs> I concluded that I really didn't like Busiek's uh, work on on the. Uh, commercial properties mm, mm -hmm. the license you know not license but you know what i mean the right. um, big two properties right right well it, it's since you mentioned that uh because i i was like uh, before we got on here I, I, I looked up my collection to see well what other pacheco stuff do do i have mm -hmm. do, do i have more than just avengers forever and and this and i i do um but one of the things that they they came uh, back together and collaborated on was the uh, Trinity series from DC Comics from 2008, and so Pacheco did the the art for the first six issues, and then and then a smattering of the other because this is one of those right. 52 issue series, you know, right. a weekly comic book that DC put out for a while. I should I should look for that. I mean, part of the problem with me and reading Busiek on characters like Superman was, like I said, I didn't. I hadn't yet grokked the fact that all comics now came in six issue arcs. Mm. And if you just, I was still reading it like <laughs> I was in the eighties right, right. where you could pick up an issue and just have fun. You, mm -hmm. they would fill you in on what's going on and, and you didn't even have to read the next issue. Yeah. Um, I kind of miss those. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I had 
realized you had to do that with Vertigo books, but I didn't realize you had to do it with Superman books at mm. that point. Mm -hmm. All of that has pluses and minuses, I guess. <laughs> it would be weird. It would be weird to pick pick this up in the middle. I mean, I think. Oh yeah, it's all about the arc that that the character in the story takes. Yes, and and that makes me um, really interested on what the next arc, character arc. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. that Fletcher goes through in this new series. Yeah, and that's at the moment hard to say what uh, Busiek is is going for from this first issue because again he's he's very not plotting but he's just moving along at the pace he's moving along at mm -hmm. and he's not um in any big obvious way teasing what's coming next ah okay so it sounds like he's uh writing from the same playbook that he he built for the first series right so I think reading it, you have to go into it not just accepting the fact that he's going to continue using the the boys' pulp formula mm -hmm. as the overlay. I wonder what happened. I, he meets up with Rocky. I, I'm not spoiling too much here. Now, there's not a lot to spoil about this issue anyway. He meets up with Rocky, but I don't. I, now I have to reread it now because I read it before reading those six. And see if they even talk about Grace. Hmm. I think they might mention her briefly. The other thing is in, in the back matter here, he says originally he wrote this as a novel. Really? And something caused it not to get published. So now they're turning it into a comic. Oh, see, I could totally see this working as as a series of novels as well. Right. Uh, you know, considering the the whole alternate history thing of of Aerosmith to begin with. Uh, and having, like I said, having read the, right. these six issues, it made me want to read more alternate history uh, novels, you know, right. by other people. And and, uh, and then, so that was, the that was the next thing I was going to do is go figure out who should I read? Should I start with yeah. Watt Evans? Should I go somewhere else? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So I think he pictured this as kind of a tapestry of his world mm -hmm. with all these different pieces. The only problem with that is is underlying it is the horror of war and... So the fun of looking at all the pieces of this alternate history, but we've already got the big point in this first six issues. Right. War, right. war is just way more horrible than than anybody going into it imagines. Yeah, and see, that's why I was asking, uh, you know, what is this character arc that Fletcher goes on with this series, this new series? Yeah. Because boy, when you once you tackle the whole idea of war as hell and and its impact on on individuals, uh, what where do you go from there? <laughs> right. I'm now guessing because it's called Behind Enemy Lines, we may be getting much more of a view eventually, not in this first issue at all, of what's going on behind, oh. you know, in the Prussian lines. Well, and and I... Uh, hopefully, and in Prussian society, perhaps. I don't know. This is, I don't think this is a spoiler either because I think he's, Busick has said, th said this or said as much in the lead up to this new series, but... Um, he gets taken prisoner uh, by uh, ah. by the, the the Prussians, and so he has to endure being a prisoner of war and what that does to him. I guess right. So that's a new way of a new, another. There's many aspects of the horror. Of yeah, war. yeah. And it's it's planned to be twelve issues. So oh, I didn't realize that. That's another reason, perhaps, why not a whole lot is revealed in the first issue. Mm. It's it's kind of. You know, since the bulk of it takes place back in England, where they're not quite on R and R, but but they're uh, taking time away from the front lines before he's sent off on this special mission. So anyway, I think it's a it's a fascinating and unusual comic book. Then and now, I think, yeah, still, I so you know it holds up in that way because it's it's different from much of everything else on the stands. Yeah, I. I mean, again, he's imagining, Busiek is imagining, after he does this 12-issue series, they're going to do a whole bunch more. But I'm just going to wait for him them to finish the 12-issue series and not worry about it. <laughs> right. They're going to right. do more. <laughs> <laughs> has, has, um, has Pacheco been doing anything recently in other comics? Because I just don't. Yeah, I all seeing his name around. I actually looked that up when I was looking him up in terms of my own collection, and uh, he looks like he does a lot of covers. 
mm-hmm. uh, or he's he's you know he's done a lot of covers over the years. Um, I don't I couldn't find other than the new Aerosmith series. I couldn't find anything recent. I'm sure I'm missing something. So yeah, you know your your viewers and our listeners uh, maybe they can let us know. But I I couldn't find anything besides his cover work. Uh, yeah. since, since 2015, the last thing that I have in my collection that he worked on in terms of the interiors was a squadron Supreme miniseries that Marvel oh. put out, uh, at that time. So, right. Yeah, but that's, well, that's, I that's hope they make a lot ago. of money from this, the individual creators mm. and that, that it keeps them going. On. Yeah. Yeah. And anything to keep, you know, Carlos Pacheco doing interiors. Yes. The I, covers are beautiful, but to me, the interiors are always the really important thing. Yeah, I, I, I do not understand why he's not uh, a bigger commodity in doing stuff, and may, or maybe, maybe he is in other areas. Maybe he's doing stuff uh, for Hollywood know, or something. Yeah, else. yeah, uh, you know, maybe European comics or something. I don't know. So, true, true. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, he does live in Spain. I think that was mentioned in one of these uh, back matters. And he and I think it said he and his inker. Although he has a different inker now. So, well, this was really great. I think we've t- we're talked out on it. I, I think so. I, I yeah. had I had I had a bunch of other things, but it doesn't really matter that yeah. we get. Well, into if you that. have anything to throw out, I'm no, 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 no. That, that, I I think we've we've pretty much covered everything uh-huh. through the yeah. the gamut of of what Aerosmith was. I I really enjoyed it, uh, despite my my nitpickiness uh, of certain aspects mm-hmm. of it. Uh, I can't wait to when this is. When Aerosmith uh, Volume One, the trade collection hits the stands, I'll be I'll be getting that and reading uh-huh. it. So I think it's coming out in a hardcover. Ooh, even better. <laughs> Let's see. There's an ad for it here already. It wow. Say. It was supposed to come out this month, but because of all the delays in the supply chain, it oh, didn't. Oh, you mean you mean the first volume? The sorry, the first volume. Okay. It looks like a hardcover in the yeah. picture. It doesn't yeah, say. I, yeah, you're They're right. They're now saying April. 2022 okay well there you go so um, you're the folks seeing I don't this know, i don't know if it will be oversized i think i would buy it if it's la- a larger size mm. but if it's just the same size as the comic book i already have the comics and they're uh, a good way to look at the art yeah yeah i don't know that a, a normal size yeah collection like you say would would enhance the readings but but you get you get the issues all collected so Right. Um, I don't know how scarce these these issues are. It was pretty easy for me to get those six issues. Right. I don't think they cost me very much. There wasn't much buzz left around around this series. But so. but that was before the announcement. So right. <laughs> right. It may now be harder. Yeah. I also wonder if once Image puts out this hardback, if there'll be a sort of digital trade available, mm. which tempts me to just look at Pacheco's art. On the uh, look oh. at the coloring, especially yeah, in a digital format. Perhaps, perhaps I can get it through my library digital app, uh, Hoopla. I don't mm. know if your library has that one. No, unfortunately um, not. A lot of image does show up there. Oh, but I need to move, Damien. Yes, you need to move <laughs> to Portland. First, we first we're going to lower the housing prices for you, and then you can move. If you could do that, that would be great. <laughs> Okay, well, I think I'll uh, close out the broadcast. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch everyone else. I hope you're having a, everyone else the next time. I hope you're having a good uh, comic book reading week, and we'll talk later. Bye bye. <laughs>